I'll demonstrate that God is in control of all world powers. And I'll be focusing on how God has controlled nations in history. I won't be talking about much from the past few decades, as this will be covered in three weeks um, when we have a talk on um, how God is controlling the current events. There's also an enormous amount of things we can talk about when discussing God's control of world powers. But tonight I'll be primarily focusing on how God uh, controls the, uh, the nations um, to tr achieve what he wants with the people, the Jews. Um, we'll briefly look at um, tonight why God chose to show a particular interest in the Jews, then uh, the God's prediction of the fall of Israel in AD 70, and then we'll look at the following oppression of the Jews um, that's after AD 70, and then we'll have a look at um, what is termed the fishers and the hunters, which is Theodore Herzl, um, the Belfort Declaration and the Holocaust. Um, and these were to uh, cause the Jews to return to Israel. And finally, we'll look at the prediction of the formation of Israel. We are Christadelphians, and we believe in an all-powerful God who has a purpose with this earth, and he therefore manipulates peoples and nations to further this purpose. We also believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God, and we base everything we do off the Bible. So if, if you have an, a Bible with you, I'll encourage you to uh, follow along with us tonight so you can see for yourself uh, the power of God in the nations. Firstly, the Bible is, um, quite, quite clearly claims that God is in control of the nations, as we read in uh, Daniel 4, verse 17, um, which at the end of the uh, second half of the verse says, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth it up over, and setteth up over it the basest of men. So clearly, the Bible here claims that God is both capable of controlling um, the nations and puts in power whoever He wishes. Firstly, we need to prove that Israel is indeed um, God's people. This is simply solved by looking at uh, Exodus 6, verse 17, which I'll take from the ESV, just to make things a bit simpler, which says, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you, you out from under the burden, burdens of the Egyptians. So we can clearly see that God has chosen Israel here to be his people. So what does it mean that Israel is God's chosen people? Well, we read that God has um, chosen Israel to be his people in Isaiah 53, uh, 43. If you could turn there now, please. And beginning at verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith Yahweh, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am Yahweh, and beside me there is no saviour. I have declared and have saved, I have showed there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith Yahweh, that I am God. Uh, yea, before the day was I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? So when Israel was a nation in ancient times, they were surrounded by nations and peoples who uh, believed in many um, other gods. And they often had fairly fluid and changing religious beliefs in contrast to uh, Israel, who only believed in the one God, and that is the God of Israel. And as we know, Israel is still a nation today, but nearly none of these nations around uh, still exist. Therefore, Israel is still a witness of God's existence and power today. And as a result, Israel must continue to survive no, what, no matter who or what opposes them or what happens to them. However, this doesn't mean it's been 
it, it has been or will be a smooth ride for Israel. Not only have they been through hardships, but they have been through hardships God has deliberately put on them, as we will soon see. So I will spend tonight looking at how God has manipulated world powers to ensure his promises in regard to Israel um, will be fulfilled. So thus far, we've seen the Bible claims that God is in power and puts, power, it puts in power whoever he wants. God has chosen Israel, or as they are now known, the Jews, to be his people. God is using the Jews as his witnesses, and therefore they cannot be wiped out. And therefore we can see God's control in, of the nations as he manipulates people, peoples and nations to get the results he is looking for with his people. So we'll start looking at the predictions um, regarding his people. The first is the prophecy in Deuteronomy 28, which, um, if you could turn there now, please. This chapter is often referred to as the chapter of blessings and cursings, as it sets out first a list of blessings that will happen to Israel if they obey and follow God, and then a list of curses that will happen if they don't obey God. Now, uh, Deuteronomy was written, written about the year 1300 BC, and, um, sorry, about 1200 BC, which is roughly 1300 years before um, the first event we're going to talk about um, happened. And we have physical copies dated from around 100 BC, which um, is about 200 years from the event we're about to look at. Um, so we can. So any predictions that happen within this chapter um, are clearly prophetic, as in because they were written before these events happened. In the first century, you find the Druze are discontent with the Romans ruling over them. The Romans have installed rulers who don't carry favour with the populace, and on top of this, various uh, sects of the Jews are gaining traction. Then this boils over in AD 66. Two things happen: a Greek mob profanes a prominent uh, synagogue, which leads to riots among the Jews. And at the same time, Gessius, uh, Gessius um, Florus, the Ro Roman ruler of Judah, decides it was a good time to collect overdue taxes. And he achieved this by plundering the treasure of the Jewish temple. And this in turn led to um, some protests. In retaliation to these um, protests, Gessius captured and executed thousands of Jews, the majority of whom had nothing to do with any of these uh, issues or protests. The Jews were greatly angered by this, which resulted in Gessius being besieged and later killed by the Jewish horde um, and many uh, Romans with him. This was the beginning of the Jewish revolt. The Romans had to deal with this revolt and they sent uh, this uh, General Vespasian to deal with the revolt. So we read in the, of the first prediction in verse 49. And Yahweh shall bring a nation against thee from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the, e as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor favour favor to the young. We can see here that the nation here that was uh, predicted to overthrow the Jewish people was a nation from a long way from Israel. And key, um, quite key here was they were symbolised by the eagle. This fits the Romans exactly, as they came from a long way from Israel. They spoke a language which the Jews uh, would not speak, as typically Jews only spoke Hebrew, Greek and a small amount of surrounding languages. However, very few would have spoken Latin, the language of the Romans. On top of this, the Romans used an eagle mounted on a, stra on a staff to symbolise them in battle. So they very much fitted with this prediction here. So if we continue on in our historical story, we find that Vespasian, the, ge the Roman general, moved into Israel and systematically um, moved around the region, suppressing any resistance from the Jews and wiping out entire villages. 
The Romans had uh, deliberately made decision decision to be exceptionally brutal, to make a point, and brutal they were. Things were so brutal at one point, um, history tells us, several cities found out of the approach of the Romans, not by messages, but by bodies floating down the Jordan River. And throughout his com- campaign, Vespasian often left his generals, let his generals uh, have free, free reign to do as they wanted with whatever and whoever in the villages and surrounding areas. As a result, the soldiers ate whatever they wanted and took whatever they wanted. So if we read on in verse 51, we read, and a nation, uh, sorry, and he he shall, that is uh, Vespasian with his Roman legions, and he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep until he have destroyed thee. So we can see here, this is um, quite clearly predicted, the destruction of the Jews by the Romans in fairly good detail. And uh, during this time, many of the uh, Jews fled as a result of Vespasian's campaign to avoid the destruction and this led to many Jews um, spreading into all the lands all over the empire as shown here. As you can see the Jews uh, emigrated from uh, to many places including all the way to the British Isles um, all the way back to Turkey. Now we continue our story on reading in verse 52. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy thy high and fence walls come down, wherein thou trustest. Throughout all thy land he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which Yahweh thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which Yahweh thy God hath given thee, in the siege and in the straightness wherein thy enemies shall distress thee, so that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eye shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he hath not, have nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in thy gates." Thy tender and delicate woman among you, which would not venture to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter, and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet, and toward her children which shall, she shall bear. She shall eat them uh, for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness, wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates." And this is actually what we, pretty much exactly what we find happening in Jerusalem um, when they were besieged by Vespasian. Soon after the siege, after sieging the city, the Romans built a wall around uh, Jerusalem, blocking off any escape. Any of the Jewish military who tried to escape uh, were crucified and put on display uh, to those in the city. And any of those who were not associated with the revolt who tried to escape had their stomachs sliced open as many of the Jews were, um, were trying to escape with their golden money, and they did this by swallowing it. Once the Romans found out about this, um, they took to the habit of um, opening them up. Josephus, a writer at the time, writes in his book, The Wars of the Jews, about the brutality um, of the Romans at the time. And he writes, Throughout the city, people were dying of hunger in large numbers, enduring unspeakable sufferings, In every house, the merest hint of food sparked violence, and close relatives fell to blows, snatching uh, snatching from one another the pitiful supports of life. No respect was paid even to the dying. The ruffians, that is, the anti-Roman zealots, searched them in case they were concealing food somewhere in their clothes or just pretending to be near death. Gaping with hunger like mad dogs, Lawless gangs went staggering, reeling through the streets, battered upon the doors like drunkards, 
and so bewildered that they broke into the same house two or three times in an hour. Need drove the starving to gnaw at anything. Refuse, which even animals would reject, was collected and turned into food. In the end, they were eating belts and shoes and leather strips uh, stripped off their shields. Tuft of, tufts of withered grass was devoured and sold in little bundles for four drachmas. But why dwell on the commonplace rubbish uh, which the starving were driven to feed upon? Given that which I have a account, recount is a, an act unparalleled in history, either the Greeks or the barbarians, as horrible to relate as it is incredible to hear. For my part, I should gladly have omitted this tragedy, lest I should be uh, suspected of monstrous fabrication. But there were many witnesses of it among my contemporaries, and besides, I should do a poor service to my country if I were to suppress the agonies she went through. This is talking about um, a story about a woman who's about to um, eat her own child. Um, and he continues on, among the residents of the region, Beyond Jordan was a woman called Mary, daughter of Eliezer, of the village of Beth, uh, Bethsaba. She was well off and of good family and had fled to Jerusalem with her relatives where she became involved in the siege. Most of the property she had packed up and brought with her from Perea had been plundered by the tyrants and the rest of her treasure together with such foods as she had been able to procure, was be, being carried, carried away by the henchmen. That is, the henchmen of the zealots. In their daily raids, her bitter resentment of the poor, wom poor woman cursed and abused these extortioners, and this increased, uh, incensed them against her. However, no one put her to death, either from exasperation or pity. She grew weary of trying to find food of, uh, for her kinsfolk. In any case, it was uh, by now impossible to get any, wherever you tried. Famine, famine gnawed at her victuals, and the fire of rage was even, ever fiercer than famine. So driven by fury and want, she committed a crime against nature. Seizing her child, an infant at the breast, she cried, My poor baby, why should I keep you alive in this world of war and famine. Even if we live till the Romans come, they will make slaves of us anyway, and hunger will get us before slavery does. And the rebels are called than them both. Come, be food for me, and avenge fury of, to the rebels. And a tale of cold horror to the world to complete the monstrous agony of the Jews. With these words, she killed her son, roasted the body, and swallowed half of it and store the rest in a safe place. But the rebels were at her, at her once, smelling roasted meat, threatening to kill her instant, instantly if she, had not, if she had not produced it. She assured them that she had saved them a share and revealed the remains of her child. Seized with horror and stu uh, stupefaction, uh, they uh, stood paralyzed at the sight. But she said, this is my own, my own child and my own handwork, handiwork. Eat, for I have eaten already. Do not show yourselves weaker than a woman or more pitiful than a mother. But if ye have uh, pious scruples, uh, shrink away from human sacrifice. Then what I have eaten can count as your share, and I will eat what is left as well. At that they slunk away, trembling, not daring to eat, although they were reluctant to yield even food to the mother, even this food to the mother, sorry. Um, so we can see here what was predicted in Deuteronomy 28, where it talks about people even eating their own children. Um, it's actually exactly what happened. Um, and then once the uh, Jews were defeated by the Romans and the Romans took the city, they, were mass they massacred most of the Jews. The estimates um, from history range from about 600,000 to 1.1 million Jews being killed, and the remaining 97,000 were enslaved and sold uh, to people all over the empire. 
Following the defeat of the Jews in the Jewish revolt, the Jews made a few more minor revolts after the fall of Jerusalem, which was suppressed by the Romans in a similar manner. But long after this, the Jews ceased to act as an independent state and ended up living all over the then known world, as they no longer had a land to go to. So to summarise this section, uh, sorry, uh, the Roman invasion, suppression and utter destruction of the Jews soon after Christ's uh, crucifixion was predicted, uh, including all of the gory details of death and cannibalism. So now we move on to the following persecution of the Jews over the next few centuries. For the next few decades, the Jews had some peace. However, this changed when the uh, Roman Empire turned Christian. From about the year 300, the Jews had progressively more and more laws um, <coughs> made against them. Firstly, they were forbidden to marry Christians. Then they were forbidden from holding positions in government. Then they were for forbidden, forbid, forbidden against witnessing in court. As the ostracization of Jews was formalized, bizarre stories and rumors started to be told about them. Stories about Jews with horns and tails who committed ritualistic murder were spread around. Then in 19, uh, not 19, 1095, when the Crusades started, men traveling to Israel, um, the Crusaders traveling to Israel, acted more like a mod, mob and a disciplined army. A mob which did not have proper logistics to feed troops, nor discipline to control troops. As a result, the tr uh, troops turned to taking things by force. This could only ta they could only take um, food from communities that they would not be punished for um, taking things from. Therefore, they targeted, targeted the Jewish groups in the area. The troops swept through these uh, Jewish communities looting, raping and killing as they wished. Later, these turned into more formalised, organised, formal organised massacres, which resulted in a new word being coined, which is a pogrom, which was the organised massacre of a targeted group of people. As a result, many Jewish people were killed and others had to flee their homes, uh, leaving them to be looted and sacked. Then... During the middle of the 14th century, a few decade, uh, centuries on, the bubonic plague spread throughout Europe, killing an estimated one-third of the population. Fear, superstition and ignorance prompted the need to find someone to blame. The Jews were a convenient scapegoat because of the myths and stereotypes that they already had believed about them. This led to many persecu persecutions um, of the Jews, including being uh, burned alive of about 100,000 of them. Increasingly, Jews were subject to political and economic and social discrimination, resulting in the removal of their legal and civil rights. They were restricted to living in ghettos um, by the beginning of the 13th century, and Jews were required to wear a distinctive symbol or pointed hat. Since Jews were not allowed to own land and the church did not allow Christians to loan money for profit, Jews had uh, few alternatives but, but to become money lenders. Once they became associated with this uh, forbidden trade of usury, the practice of lending money and changing high, charging high interest rates, uh, a set of new stereotypes evolved around the Jews as money hungry and greedy. This in turn furthered furthered their discri discrimination. So we can see that Jews were quite obviously dis uh, ostr ostracised and discrimina discriminated against and often killed for the heritage and circumstances they found themselves in. And this is actually what we find again in Deuteronomy um, 28, if you reading from verse uh, 64. And Yahweh shall scatter thee among all people uh, from one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou, sh nor thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. 
but Yahweh shall give thee a trembling heart and failing eyes and sorrow of mine, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have no assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even, and at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning, for the fear and for the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. So we can clearly see from this, after the fall of the Jewish state, the Jews um, would be scattered throughout the land and then persecuted continuously. So to summarise this section, the Jews were gradually ostracised from society following the uh, crucifixion of Christ. This led to many persecutions and deaths for uh, no reason other than uh, the Jewish heritage they carried. (coughs) Later, the Jews being um, forced to uh, lend money to make a living became, uh, they resulted in them being known as greedy and uh, money-loving, furthering furthering their discrimination. And of course, this is all predicted in uh, Deuteronomy 28, where it clearly predicts they, uh, the fear they would have for their lives and the hatred they would receive. Next, we'll have a look at what is um, termed the hunters and fishers. Um, if you could come to Jeremiah 16. Jeremiah 16 and reading from verse uh, 15. But Yahweh, li- but Yahweh liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither the he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send many fishes, saith Yahweh, and I- they shall fish them. And after will I send many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill out of the holes of the rocks. Uh, Here we can see that um, God wants the Jews to return to their land. As it says, I will bring them back into their land that I gave unto their fathers. And to do this, he uses what he terms hunters and fishers. So what are these hunters and fishers? As the verse indicates, they are people or groups of people who are to make the Jews return to Israel. The fishers will lure the Jews back by various means and the hunters are those who will force them or intimidate them back uh, into going back to the land of Israel. The first of these we'll be looking at tonight is uh, Theodore Herzl. He was born in about 1860 and was a Jew uh, that, that had grown up a non-reli- non-religious Jew. However, it wasn't long before he noticed that just how much people seemed to hate the Jews. He first campaigned for Jews to convert to Christianity to put an end to this hatred, this hatred. Uh, but this didn't work, as he discovered the hatred of the Jews was not so much about their religion, but more that they were hated just as a people. Then uh, what is called the Dreyfus Affair happened. Dreyfus Affair... Um, was about a Jew who uh, fully assimilated into, the, into French society and was an uh, officer in the French army. However, um, Dreyfus was framed for spying despite the strong evidence to the contrary. Dreyfus was then court-martialed and convicted and sent to Devil's Island um, uh, to be imprisoned. However, during the trial, Theodore Herzl was present and witnessed the crowd continuously chanting death to the death to the Jew. This made Herzl think the Jews um, would never be safe if they didn't have their own country, as if Dreyfus, a high-ranking official in the French army, could be framed for spying and convicted when the evidence uh, made it clear that he didn't, um, he wasn't involved in the spying, then he concluded that the only solution was for the Jews to have their own separate country. Herzl then um, went on a mission 
to bring about this dream. He went around Europe and the Middle East to try and convince Jews uh, to come back to Israel. He spent large portions of his life following this cause, to the point where people thought he was mad. He even received audiences with many rulers, including the German Kaiser, the Ottoman Sultan, and even the Pope. Herzl argued that the Jews were a nation without a homeland, and if they had a home, and they would be able to rule themselves and be free of the anti-Semitism in the countries they currently lived in. Herzl uh, continued, also tr uh, continued to try to convince Jews to move back to, the, back to Israel, but very few listened. The next thing we'll look at is the uh, Belfer Declaration. The next major time of fishing um, God sent was the Belfer Declaration. Prior to World War I, the Ottoman Turks had control of what is now uh, called Israel. Then during World War I, the British and the Allies pushed the Ottomans uh, out of Israel. After the war, the British maintained uh, control over Israel under, which, uh, under what is called the British Mandate. Soon after the Ottomans were pushed out of Israel by the British, Lord Belfer the Foreign Secretary for the United Kingdom, wrote a letter to the leader of the Zionist Federation of Great Britain and Ireland. This letter is now known as the Belfort Declaration and stated as follows. His Majesty's Government, uh, yeah, His Majesty's Government, view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. This meant that Jews were given permission and supported in moving back to Israel, but still very few Jews made the move. Since only a few Jews were coming back to Israel, or comparatively, only a few Jews were coming back to Israel. God turned to another tool he had predicted to use, and that was the hunters. And the most famous of these, of course, was the systematic hunting down, persecution, and execution of Jews, along with other minorities, under Nazi rule. This, of course, um, is now known as the Holocaust. I'm sure many of you know of the horror, horror of the Holocaust, but I'll provide a brief summary for those who are unaware. Here the Jews were first removed from the rest of society and forced to live in ghettos. Here they lived in very cramped conditions. One apartment might have multiple families li living in it, and often the plumbing uh, broke down, meaning human waste was thrown into the street with the garbage. Disease spread rapidly, and the Germans also limited the food purchases, meaning that there was often not enough food to go around. During winter months, heating fuels were scarce, meaning many homes would not be heated and many, lacked and many of the, uh, the occupants lacked adequate clothing to keep themselves warm. Some even took their lives to uh, escape from the horrific conditions. Many children were orphaned and had to live on the streets as a result and these often froze to death in the winters. Later, the Germans turned to what they called the final solution. They changed from imprisoning the Jews in ghettos to either killing or enslaving them. Jews were rounded up and transported to camps to be used as labor. Those Jews, those the Germans saw unfit to work, such as the sick, the elderly, and children, were either shot before transporting or gassed on arrival to the camps. At the camps, um, Jews were worked until they died from the various diseases, injuries, or insufficient food provided to them. This period of torture, humiliation, and death made it clear to the Jews that they needed a homeland for, a life, for life to be safe. Therefore, Jews began to uh, migrate to Israel in huge numbers. However, they were not a nation yet, as they were still Jews living under British rule in Palestine. So to summarise this section, um, God needed the Jews to move back 
uh, into the land, uh, the land of Israel. So he organised for what Jeremiah called the fishers and hunters. These fishers and hunters included Theodore Herzl, who raised, first raised the issue and pushed for a land just for, the, just for the Jews, while encouraging the Jews to move back to Israel. However, uh, not many did. Then God sent Lord Balfour to make the Balfour Declaration, which gave the support of uh, Britain to the Jews to establish in Israel. But still, comparatively few moved. As a result, God had no other option but to send the hunters. The primary one being uh, the Holocaust, which God used to show the Jews there was no safe land outside of uh, Israel. And as a result, many of the Jews did indeed move to Israel. Next, we must look at the formal formation of the Jewish state. If you could come over to uh, Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel wrote roughly in uh, between 570 and 592 BC. So anything we read here is uh, quite clearly prophetic when uh, of speaking of the Jews reforming their land, uh, their nation. Uh, so starting reading in um, verse one. The hand of Yahweh was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of Yahweh and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And then reading on in verse 4 and 5. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. And then in verse 10. So I prophesied uh, as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood up, stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. So as you can see um, from this very brief look at Ezekiel 37, um, way back nearly 2,600 years ago, God foretold of the return of Israel to their land and the reformation of their nation, or army as uh, Ezekiel calls it here which happened in 1948. So to summarise uh, what we've seen tonight, um, we can see there is plenty of evidence that God is in control of the nations. We have seen that God predicted the fall and fall of Israel and Jerusalem in AD 70. How that... Uh, how that it had to be a nation from a far country who spoke a language the Jews did not know and was symbolised by an eagle. And this, of course, perfectly fits with the Romans. And we saw how the Romans besieged Jerusalem and that people got so desperate that they ate their own children, um, which was predicted in Deuteronomy 28 as well. Then we saw how the Jews were oppressed in the lands they fled to and were ostracised and therefore uh, could not find any ease uh, in life, as once again was predicted in Deuteronomy 28. Then we saw how God used the, what he terms the hunters and the fishers to get the Jews to return to the land. And this was through Theodore Herzl and the Belfort Declaration, encouraging them to move to Israel and helping them to do so. But this did not work on any large scale. So God was forced to send what he terms the hunters, which accumulated in the Holocaust. Which was so horrific and brutal, God knew the Jews would have to see no option but to move back to Israel. So we can quite clearly see God's hand in work in the nations and how he can move nations and people around to get the results he wants. And of course, a God is, uh, who is this powerful uh, is a God who can do many things many other things including giving you and I uh, life after death however unfortunately this is a topic for another time so we'll have to uh, leave it there so thank you for listening